All right, finally, we're going to get to part two of that Toyota W58 transmission rebuild. And so there's a few things that I prepped first that I want you to look at. I did the case blasting, um, had some of the gears cleaned up pretty good, and I bought a rebuild kit. Pretty much you would put the main shaft together exactly as I took it apart, except when we get to the midsection, because of course we had to do something backwards to get that fifth gear out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just basically run through how the main shaft goes back together. But first thing I want to do is point out something when you're buying these rebuild kits online. If you're going to buy rebuild kits on Amazon or eBay, it's very important that you look at a few things that I'm going to show you. So let's get to it. So here's your typical W55 through 58 Toyota rebuild kit. And you got your gaskets, your seals, your main bearings, your counter gear bearings, your fist speed gearings, and your synchronizer rings. These kits do not include any hard parts like gears, obviously. And they do not include any of the small parts like the needle bearings, like these types of needle bearings, or spacers, or thrust, thrust washers, or snap rings like this. So it's important that you don't damage any of these parts. So Briefly, with this kit, what I want to show you that it's a pretty common problem. When you're buying these aftermarket kits, whether you go again on eBay or Amazon to get them, and I do stock some of these kits, the problem, and it's out of our control, is that there's only one manufacturer currently making these replacement synchronizer rings. And the synchronizer rings seem to work good. You could check them out yourself. You could try them out on the gears. I'm going to take the third speed ring. I'm going to go put a third speed ring on the gear. They seem to fit good. They, the height seem to be good. But what you want to look for is if the ring wobbles, okay? Like, see this ring here? It's wobbling on this gear. That's not really good. And I'm looking to see if it's dirty anywhere, if there's any type of anything on the cone of the gear, or any type of dirt or metal filings on the ring, and it doesn't fit good, okay? It's a warp ring. So I would rather use the original equipment ring if it's not bad, or deburr the ring and find out why. Maybe it's got a high spot in here. Maybe there's some metal. But you just don't want to take these rings out of the box and put them on the gear. You'll usually end up with problems. That's one example of something that's crappy about them. The other ring, the OEM ring, you can see it fits on nice. The height is good. So you want to know what? I'm going to reuse this ring. There's nothing wrong with it. It wasn't grinding in third gear. And the height is really good and it fits well. And by the height, I mean that this gap between the back side of the ring to the gear, it's not flat up against, against it. Toyota calls somewhere for around 25 thousandths gap and this has got more than that it's plenty it's perfect ring it was never grinding in gear there's no indication that it was grinding in gear these teeth aren't messed up teeth aren't messed up on the slider so this is good this is going to stay with that but again check to see and you'll have like crap like this happen and it's not a good part put the other one on here same thing so the rings are warped all right not good not good a product now you put this on the gear it doesn't even lock it up all right so again, you can buy these rebuild kits, put all this stuff together and end up with gear grinding issues. The other thing is with some of these rings is the oil slots in the rings don't go all the way through. Now, what I that, by that I mean is if you look at this particular ring here, you could see that the oil slots go completely through the threads. That's very important because that allows the ring to pretty much exhaust the oil correctly. And so when you were doing it like this, it'll work fine. When you're, when you're shifting a box with this type of setup on it, the ring comes against the gear and the oil can be exhausted properly. Now on a lot of these rings, what I'm noticing is that the oil slots are not cut all the way through. So if you have to use one of these rings, you're gonna have to take a file and cut these slots through completely yourself manually. And if the ring is warped, then you're gonna have to not use it anyway. All right, so when it comes to putting together these synchronizer assemblies, they pretty much all follow the same procedure. 
If you recall on the disassembly video, we have a little kind of a step here on the slider, and that faces towards the front of the unit. Inside, we have three positions that the keys can go into relative to the hub. So what you want to do is if you haven't marked the sliders beforehand, put them in like this, make sure they're nice and smooth. Move it around to the next position to see if it's any better. This is in case you haven't marked them, okay? That feels a little bit more tight. It seems to be hanging up a little bit. And we'll flip it around again here. That seems about the smoothest. Nice and easy, going through nice and easy, no problem at all. Now what we're going to do is lay this down here. And then we're going to take one of the keys, start with a tang in front of it like this, put the key in, put the next key in, and then the next key in. The tangs will end up on the back of each key, okay? It goes around this way counterclockwise to that key. Now if we flip it over, what we're going to do is do it exactly the same way because the spring is going to be here now. So we're going to get a perfect balance of pressure doing it this way. That's how you put together all the synchronizer assemblies for the unit. Now I've kept the snap ring for this one here. That's going to go back on that on the 3-4. We repeat the same process for all the synchronizer assemblies. Now, if you recall, on the fifth speed synchronizer assembly, the retaining plate got a little bent having to remove it. So I straightened out the plate. It's pretty much what a pair of pliers. It was no big deal. It was easy to fix. And the retainer fits into these little slots on the back side of the assembly. If you notice on the assembly here, there is no pointy teeth on the back side of that fifth speed assembly. So that's how you know what way to put the slider on. And of course, it's got a little indent over here, and that's going to be facing the fifth gear with the pointy teeth. And you can see that I did the same thing, put the springs, I use the same key, I start with the same key, go around this way, flip around using that same key, going around this way again. Now what we're going to do is put that retainer on here, and this kind of presses in place. So I'm going to take my little tool here and just kind of push it in, get it set for us. Make sure that the tangs are in there. If anything, you don't want to break these tangs because that's the only thing keeping this retainer in place. Perfect. So what we're doing here is the retainer simply holds the keys from popping out. And you could test that by putting the fifth gear with the ring inside of it like this. Catch it, okay, and put it into gear. You can see that the retainer holds the keys in place, just like that. That's all it is. Just as long as they don't pop out, when you pull it back this way, you're okay. It's not going to go any place. So again, we can put it in, and we can see that the keys aren't going to pop out. The retainer is doing its job. That's all it has to do. Also, the three strut keys, you always want to inspect them, make sure they're not worn in any way. These look like new. I mean, they have very little wear on them. You want to flip them over. You want to make sure that they're not cracked in any way or that the corners aren't chipped. That's very important. So now I'm going to put together the one-two assembly, and I just wanted to show you I actually put a little kind of a notch mark in there with my die grinder just to make sure that I keep the hub and the slider in the same exact position they were beforehand. And same thing, we're going to just simply put the key in there, wrap the spring around, doing it the other way where you have to put the keys in with grease and hold them in place can get messy. This is a lot easier doing it this way. So using the same key again, flip it around, put the spring in that position too. So the input shaft bearing I heated on using my bearing heater. This is no big deal, it dropped right in place. I used my bearing clamps to take the old bearing off. It's just a simple procedure. I didn't think I needed to waste time showing you how to pull another bearing off. It was a little pitted, this input, but it blasted pretty clean. And I'm using an adapter pilot. And this adapter pilot is for a Triumph TR6 conversion. So I'm putting some green thread locking compound on it. I'm going to just put a little bit on all over the, the input. Let it drip down. 
put it in here. It's pretty, it's a high strength. It's almost like crazy glue. So this thing is going to go on here and gently tap it into place. So they give you this pilot bushing with the conversion kit and that's going to fit like this now. And when the bushing goes into the crank, it's going to tighten up a little bit as well, but that's pretty much how it works. Now, when it comes to prepping the gears, one thing I like to do is break the glaze of the old synchronizer rings on the cones. Sometimes you could see some discoloration of the cones. Maybe the rings weren't hitting them right or whatever. And, or sometimes if the gear was sitting for a long period of time and, and in this particular application, there was some rust on the outside. I take some 800 paper and I just go over the cone and I break the glaze on the synchro cone of the gear. I'll do this to all the cones. And so when I put the new rings on them, they've got a really good surface to bite against. I use this preparation on all the gearboxes I do if I'm doing rebuilds. And even on the new transmissions, a lot of times the cones have some roughness to them that they need to be cleaned up a bit. That bite's pretty good even on the old ring. When I put the new rings on, it's going to be even better. So I'll just clean this up a little bit more. That looks nice. The case sections were completely cleaned and glass beaded. This is no paint on it or anything. This is just basically cleaned up and beaded. So it looks a hell of a lot better than it did before. And we're going to start assembling this transmission now. I did the same thing on the counter gear. I pulled the old bearing off, pressed the new bearing on. It's very simple. This comes right off. One thing that I would suggest is that this particular bearing has a spacer behind it and to reuse the old spacer that's on the gear because you never know if the dimensions of the spacers are different. And being that you have selective snap rings and they're almost impossible to get, you don't want to ruin your snap rings, but you want to take it apart, re-grease the bearing, press it back on, and this goes on really with a light tap. You can just use a, a socket to put it on and just tap it with a socket. What we're going to do is we're going to simply reverse the procedure, except when we get to the midsection, it's going to be a little bit different. But what we're going to do is put second gear on with the bearing, the one, two synchronizer assembly. And the one, two synchronizer assembly is going to have this square cut edge facing towards the mid plate. So it's going to go on. So we're going to have the second gear go on here with the roller like this. The assembly go on that. Let's put this in place so we have it. And the first speed gear and its roller bearing assembly go on. And when you're putting these assemblies together, if you have to hold the rings in the hubs with grease, so if you're pressing things together, you want to make sure that these slots of the rings go into these keys over here. So a lot of times you may want to hold them in with grease. That's how that assembly is going to go back together for one, two, and it's going to go on the main shaft like this. And then right behind it, rear bearing is going to go in place. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some assembly lube and put it on this main shaft like this. Usually what I do is I'll put the bearing on first. That's the second gear. Now, what I'll do too, is since I'm reusing this ring and it's a good ring, I've polished the cones of the gears and I'll take some sort of uh, other lube that I use for them 
I use this HVL assembly lube. You can use any assembly lube you want. I like this, this lubricant because the rings won't stick to the gears, especially if the box is going to be sitting for a while. That feels really good. Now, this assembly is going to go on with that square edge facing towards the back. Now one thing is I'm going to just seat this with a hammer a little bit just to kind of make sure it's caught on the spline. I'm going to put it on the press. I'm going to use one of these bearing races I have here like this and then I'll push it down on the press and press the whole thing up so it's solid against the flange. So again that's going to go like this so you get a better view. You want to make sure that the keys are caught in it and everything is going to get pressed on that way. So what I'm doing here is I'm putting some grease because this anti-rotation ball has to go on here for the first speed gear bearing race. I'm going to drop down the first gear synchronizer ring catch it within the keys, make sure it's caught like this. Then what I'm going to do is got some assembly lube on the gear, put the gear down. And while that's there, I'm just lay this here for a second, all right? Just so you see what I'm going to do here. I'm going to take some assembly lube, assembly grease I should say, and hold that bearing in place. Just like this, okay? Well, you got it? that down here. First gear on. There it is. So both front and rear main bearings are the same size on this particular unit. On later renditions, the rear bearing is a little bit bigger, but I heat these in place, I drop them in place, it's no big deal. You can press them in place, no reason to show you how to do that on a press. But more importantly, when you put the rear bearing on, whether you're going to be putting it down on a press, make sure that you press from the inner ring, or if you're heating it, more importantly, make sure that the retaining snap ring groove is facing towards the rear and not towards the front. So I put some more of this HVL lube on the gear cone. Get the lube worked into the ring really good. Again, this is a nice ring. It fits well. It's solid. It locks up. I'll put some of the HVL lube on the shaft. You can use gear lube as well. And slide the gear on. I'm put it on its end. So lube's on there, lube's on the ring, okay? And what we want to do is put the 3 4 synchronizer assembly in place. This hub goes on pretty easy, so I'm going to just use a socket, okay? Again, making sure I'm catching the keys in the ring. Just drive it down with a socket. That's perfect. And also notice that that square edge here is facing towards the front. So on the 1, 2, square edge faces towards the back. On a 3, 4, it faces towards the front. Okay, so now I'm going to put on the 
three four synchronizer snap ring now snap rings always have a direction it's hard to say but they're you have an edge that's angled like this and you want to make sure that that narrow part of the edge in other words the closed part is facing towards the way you want to remove the snap ring so that it doesn't slip off the pliers if you have to take the snap ring off a lot of people who build units don't do that and not to mention that it's kind of rude for anybody who has to take the unit apart later on getting that snapping off can be a real bear so these go on pretty easy here you go so the upper gear train is ready to go back into the midsection all right so obviously i want to prep both gear trains before i put them in the midsection so this is the new bearing from the kit i'm going to take off the snap ring from it it's a split bearing so the bearing actually comes apart it snaps together and so what we're going to do now is get some assembly lube and then snap the bearing back in place around this this can only go in one way by the way That floats like that. We'll take some more lube and we'll put it on the outer race. Slide that over like this. And it just kind of floats in there. So now we're going to lay everything up here, ready to go. Now the other part is the input shaft. And we have to take that cartridge bearing from the input shaft and put it inside the input. Again, using more assembly lube. There's no particular direction for this bearing. This goes right in there like that. You may want to check to see that it fits okay. It fits nice. So there you go there. And we'll put the synchronizer ring on it as well. Again, I checked all these rings and I polished the cones of the gears. These rings fit really good. They're not worn out at all. The only one that's questionable is actually the fifth speed ring, and I'll show you that in a second. Put some more assembly lube on this particular gear. Again, catching the keys into the ring. So here we have a whole gear train together. This is pretty much how it's going to be inside the transmission again. All our main bearings are in place. Counter gear front bearing, counter gear rear bearing is in place, and we're ready to slide this into the mid plate. But before we do that, let me show you something that I do on the mid plate. I have these little metal strips I have laying in the shop from other applications, and they're just simply quarter inch flat stock with a hole drilled in them at the end. I put them in the vise, they bolt them to the bottom of the plate, and I put that in the vise. And this allows the plate to rest on top of the vise and makes it really secure. Makes it a really nice stable setup to put the whole gear train back in it. Now, usually what I do is, rather than mess with the interlocks while everything is together, I'll put the interlocks in here now and hold it in place with paper towels. This way it's a lot easier trying to fish them in now rather than wait when it, the gears are in the way or rails are in the way or whatever it makes it a lot easier and then you just push the paper towels out through the holes you don't have to do it that way but that's the way i like doing it because it's a lot easier on the assembly part so what i'll do is i'll just stuff some paper towels in these holes let's get something a little bit more substantial in there you can use anything actually you can use plugs this works pretty good See, when you try to drop them in through the top, it's very hard because they tend to fall out. It's very rarely is it, is it easy to get them through here in this method to go down from one hole to the other. But it does do it. So what I'm doing now is I'm going to just push it in there with the paper towel. Okay. We got that interlock in. Now we're going to just stuff this passage with some towel like that. Put the larger one in. 
This is kind of hard to come out because it's so long, so it'll just pretty much drop right down like that. And I like, again, working on it because you see I have nothing in my way. I can push them in place, make sure they're all there, and put the towels in. They're not going to go anywhere. Now, I would suggest you use kind of a light oil like WD-40, spray it in the bore. And if you have any burrs in the bore from removing the components, file them down, clean it up, make sure the bores are nice and smooth. I'm holding it like this. Put this piece in. It's pretty tricky doing this. It really isn't easy. Be good if I had a helping hand here. Okay. But But I'm always fascinated by the precision of this hole, how it kind of really fits in. You just kind of have to wiggle it around to get it started, you know? See? Use the back shafts as leverage. And they'll start coming through. I don't recommend tapping on anything. <clears throat> you just keep on working it. Look at that. See, I've got the snap ring grooves protruding now, so I can put the snap rings in place, and that'll hold everything together. If your bearings come with some new snap rings, you may want to reuse the old snap rings because they may be slightly different sizes. So I tend to reuse the old rings. Here, especially if you look at the replacement snap ring that they give you with the the bearing and how different and thin the other snapping is for the rear bearing, the one that came from the factory. So I always reuse the original snapping if I can. Slightly with a rubber mallet, I'm going to just tap everything forward so it seats against the housing. That looks nice. So I put blue thread locker on these bolts. I'm just going to get them well started. So this is a T40 socket, and the factory says to torque them down to 13 foot-pounds. By the way, when this Toyota unit comes apart, normally you would have, again, the Toyota tool kit, which is a series of pullers that work in several directions. One direction, the fifth gear gets pulled off, and another direction, the, the fifth gear actually gets jacked back in place. If you have something or you're thinking of making something like that, be very careful again because the gears are very brittle and they will chip and get damaged. So unless you have something that's really going to fit the gear perfectly and not damage the teeth in any way, I suggest doing it the way I'm doing it. Now, I've heated these gears up before in the past. There's no damage to doing that, but you have to work quick. So while the gear is expanded, it's permissible to tap it in place because it'll slide in pretty easy without any resistance but you do need a little bit of kind of persuasion to get that gear back in place. 
Usually the reverse gears are much easier to go on, but the fifth gear is still going to be a little bit tight. And so again, same thing with some of the synchronizer hubs. You might have to just tap them in place a little bit and it's permissible to do that. You're not going to have any problems, trust me. So what I'm doing is I'm heating up the gear on my uh, Kuza Max uh, plate warmer. And I use that for some bearings and some heavy duty gears when I need to, when they have very hard press fits. Once it gets hot enough, use it up to about 285 degrees. Then I'll go slide that on the main shaft. It should go right on. These snap rings that go on this reverse gear, as well as the one on the input shaft, are the same snap rings that are used in 307 bearings on the T10 transmission. So I happen to have a bulk of these snap rings around. So if you've got a snap ring that's a little bit stretched out, you can use one of these T10 rings and they work perfect. I'm not really hitting it that hard, okay? But it's pretty snug fit, but went on pretty good. Bottomed out. There we go. I was a little worried about that one. Let's go on. Yeah. Okay, so with a little heat, I was able to get this on, reverse gear, and a new snap ring, fifth speed gear, the rear extension housing bearing. Everything's nicely cooled down now, so I'm gonna reinstall that snap ring that was in the back there. Now these are very hard to get back on without them sometimes flying, so be very careful when you put them on that they don't fly out. And it's kind of like when they get through the halfway point, I use a punch just to snap them in place. Now, same thing. Make sure it's seated in the groove properly. Believe it or not, you can use a T5 3 4 world-class snap ring in case you break this. This works fine. I've used them before, but this snap ring is pretty good, so I'm gonna still use it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the fifth speed synchronizer hub and assembly on this particular cone heater. I'm gonna use my infrared thermometer again. And when this thing hits about 200 degrees, then I'll be able to take this off and slide that into place. So what's good about the cone heater It'll just kind of heat the inner diameter of the hub, which is all I really need to do. I really don't want to be bothered heating everything else here, so it'll just heat this fine. This goes on fairly easy. Again, it's already heated, but it's kind of like a, a rounded, rolled spline. All right, so as I mentioned before, usually I'll take some 1500 paper, I'll start with 800 paper if the cones are, maybe have some rust on them, and I'll just scuff them up and clean them up, make them look pretty again. If you have a lathe, that would be awesome. You could put the gear on the, on the lathe, chuck it up on the lathe there and get the finish nice and clean on the cone. Now you see the old ring, when I put it on here, it's not grabbing, I'm putting pressure on here and it's not really locking up on the gear. It's got good thread engagement. I could see the lines of the threads, but it's not working right. So I'm gonna put the new ring on. This isn't wobbling and the gear locks. So you just wanna be able to just turn it, 
apply pressure and it should lock to the gear. I've mentioned this on several of my videos. Again, sometimes rings, because they're new, doesn't necessarily mean they work properly. But this feels good, so I'm going to use this new ring on this gear. All right, so now that the assembly's in place, I could sneak in this snap ring. And this is very difficult to do because we have to kind of push this back a little bit without the keys popping out. We can install that spacer. That goes on next. What the spacer is doing is basically giving the, a flat surface for these split rollers to ride against. And using some assembly lube, we're going to just put it on the shaft. Now, a lot of times what you can do is you can match the wear mark on the rollers if you're going to be reusing them. So they go on the same way as they did before. So I've got this kind of held in now. Put a little bit more grease on this side. I'll put assembly lube on the cone of the gear. Work that in. Now in this particular setup, what I'm going to do is take some assembly lube and put it on the three slots for the keys. And I'm going to put the ring in place and have it lock into the key slots, okay? Then I'll just put the gear on like this. Here we go. So I've got the spacer. Put the spacer back in place. So the rear bearing, this one has seals instead of the shields. And so I really don't want to heat it up because of the rubber seals, even though you're, you supposedly can, but I'm going to just use a socket and see how this one goes on. It's going on fairly easy. Okay, so the last step after we put on this Rear counter gear bearing is to install the rear counter gear snap ring. And this is a very tiny snap ring and very delicate, so you don't want to overstretch it. So when removing the snap ring for the bearing and the extension housing, I have a bunch of old screwdrivers that I usually modify and grind a little bit. In this one, what I did was I put a point on it this way, and then I gave it a little bit of a slope this way. That helps remove that snap ring and the extension housing. So what I do is I take the screwdriver, I try to move the snap ring in a location that I can get some better leverage on. You can move it around usually. It'd be great if I had somebody to hold the extension housing while I'm doing this, but we'll get it done. And once you, you get it started, you can go around and pull it up. That's going to allow us to change this bearing race here. Now, if it doesn't come out easy, you can flip it around. And come in with a long punch. And punch it through. Because you can catch the ridge, the back side of the bearing from here. So we've got that bearing race removed now. So now you just reverse the procedure and get the bearing race in here, get it started I'm using one of these little cup drivers.
So you want to catch it in the groove and take a screwdriver and just pry it in. These new seals that are rubber clad don't require any sealant on the outside of them, but you should always grease the seal. And they will just usually just press in. Let's something a little bit bigger. That looks nice. You may also want to grease the bushing a little bit. Put some grease in there because you never know how long it's going to be sitting. And that helps you from not getting corroded at all. Other thing too is I'll dress these surfaces with a file. Whereas I'll go across all these surfaces with a file, okay? And make sure that everything is true and there's no little nicks and dents keeping this unit from sealing properly. Because even though it's on dowels, you really want to make sure that you do all your surfaces. So you want to do the case surfaces with a file, the cover surface with a file, front and back surfaces of the main case, and you're good. Same thing with the front bearing retainer. I've, this was primed and painted because it's cast iron and cleaned it up. Went over this with a nice smooth file. The front seal on these is a rubber clad seal again. It should pop right out. And you put the new seal in, greasing it of course. Feels nice and even. So I'm going to start assembling the rails, the shift forks, and the reverse gear. I've got the cap installed on the top for the interlocks because the interlocks are already in here held in place with paper towels. I showed you that before. I'm going to put the reverse gear in. Notice the fork side is facing forward. The slot side of the shaft is facing inbound as well. That goes about like here. Now what we're going to do is take the fifth gear rail and you see the fifth gear rail goes on the bottom and you have the interlock cutout facing towards the top and the detent cutouts facing towards the side over here. And what I do is I put it in from the inside and what I'm doing is I'm squeezing out the paper towels And I'll get that started. Now what you may want to do, depending on how you want to put it together, is put the interlock here for the fifth and reverse. Put that in there like that. Attach this to the pivot into the gear. catch the rail in it. Now I've got the interlock held in place here. And I'm moving the rail to feel that the interlock is pressed in. You can actually feel the interlock pop out when you move the rail. So 
I'm kind of pushing the rail so it's in the neutral position and the interlock is, is in place. And I'll slide in the other rail. Like this. So now I'm going to install the hole down for both of those rails. There's slots in the rails and you catch the slots within the hole down. I'm going to run a torque wrench through these all later on. <clears throat> so now let's go do the 3-4 rail and fork. I've installed a pass-through interlock in the rail, held it in with some assembly lube. Again, the detent positions face outwards. That's great. I'm also going to install the 3 4 rail stop clip. Now, the paper towel for the 1 2 rail, the detent's already in the middle of the plate, so we can just already remove this. We had this in here so the detent wouldn't fall out. Same thing. Notice the interlock section is facing down, and the detent cut cutouts are facing towards the side again. One two uh, shift fork has the bolt facing towards the bottom, okay? There you go. So I'm going to go put in the detents. I've got some Teflon paste that I use for sealing these detent caps. I'm using this Dynatex thread sealant. I've also put in the bolts and the lock plates for the forks. They want you to torque these down to 18 foot-pounds. I'm going to put in the, the case stop ring. This bolt also gets torqued down to 18 foot-pounds. I think we should go more. This feels that's better. I'm gonna say 20. You want to talk the fork bolts down to 15 foot pounds. And of course bend over these lock tabs. Alright, so you can see I got everything in place. I got the reverse idler gear in here, the fist speed fork, all the shift rails, detents, interlocks, forks, they're all in place, and now we're ready to put both case halves back on this unit. So I've got all the hardware cleaned up. I got it all ready to go together on the final assembly here. And I'm using this conversion kit for this guy's Triumph. It's the HVDA conversion kit. You can skip this over if you're not interested in this, but basically this conversion kit, you have to remove the rubber isolator. So I knocked out this isolator that goes inside of the offset lever. And then it's a very nice piece the way it fits in here. They make this little adapter piece that fits in like this. And then you put this over it like that, and then this bolt will go in, 
and it moves the whole offset shifter location forward. It's quite clever actually. And you lock it in with these two set screws with some thread locker, but it fits in really nice. It's a very surprisingly very well made kit and the casting looks superb for it. It's very good and you will use actually the old Triumph shifter stick in this. So I'm going to put that aside. Now let's get to putting this together. But normally you won't have to have this procedure when you do your build. So the tail housing is a little tricky to get on. You want, I want to do the tail housing first because this is a lot easier to maneuver around and it's hard to do it when the front case is on. That's just my opinion. You could put the front case on if you want first, but I like doing the tail housing first and then putting the front case on. But what's going to happen is you have to lay this rail in here like this and you have to get this ready, the shift finger to attach to the rail. And what you do is you're going to start the tail in here and catch the rail in the case. And as soon as the rail can come through the case and you can catch that shift finger on the rail, you want to do that as well. Because you're going to need the shift finger to turn the rail in position to get the rest of the extension housing on. Because what happens is it's got to clear the reverse lockout mechanism that's in the extension housing. And it's a little tricky to do that. So once you see this bolt hole over here exposed, put the lock bolt just in place. It doesn't have to be tight. So you can see what you have to do to kind of clear the lockout mechanism inside. So what I'm doing is I'm pushing it up that way on the lockout, trying to get the, the tail situated and catch the bearings and everything. I think it goes like this. Yeah. So after pulling the rail this way towards me, that allows it to get in place here. Nice. See, now once we have it like this, we can support it better. And put the bolts if we need to, to try to align the front end when we put it on. Also, what you want to do is put a little light oil on the rails so they slide into case easier. So again, I've put the gasket in place. I use the anaerobic sealant on both sides of the gasket. And I also put a little bit of WD-40 on the rails and on the bearing races just to make them slide into the case easier. These can be difficult at times as well. So make sure all your burrs are taken off the case. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just catch all the bolts and what I'll do is I'll spray some WD-40 on all the bolt threads before I put it in. So I've got all the main case bolts attached. I've torqued these down to 27 foot pounds and as always I clean up any excess sealant that squeezes out around the case. So now I'm going to work on the front end and install the retaining rings for the front bearings. Sometimes you could just push them in and catch them in the grooves. So they're all in place. Now we've got the bearing retainer with the seal already in place. We're going to put the gasket on there and bolt the retainer up. So here's the sealant on both sides of the gasket again. Let's just slide this into place. Now these bolts 
are not blind holes, so you should put a little sealant on the bolts because oil could leak through the bolt threads. Now I'm going to leave this one off right now because this is where I have to put the standoff for the new hydraulics for this kit. Tighten these all down. I believe these get torqued to 18 foot pounds. All right, so I got the seven bolts and the bearing retainer attached with the HVDA stop for the hydraulics. So what, you, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take some grease if you're doing this conversion. If not, of course, this has no interest if you're out of Toyota, but you just grease, grease this up and then slide on the release bearing. And there'll be different spaces you have to put on depending on your clutch alignment. The kit comes with all these different types of shims you use to space out the hydraulic release bearing against the clutch pressure plate fingers. So these will go behind this, but you, we only could do this once the transmission is actually in the car with the bell housing to take measurements. But that's what they look like. So I've got the bolt tightened on the offset level. I just want to check Got to be down to 15 foot pounds. It's 12 millimeter. Yeah, it's good. It's not going anywhere. Then we have to put in this adapter now. And it's supposed to sneak in from underneath. Talk about being tricky, but I think we're going to have to put it in gear. I really like the way this thing fits together. It's pretty neat. I've got thread locker on the, the cap screw that they give you. That feels good. So the rubber shifter gasket has to be modified using the kit and they want you to simply cut out this section of the, the gasket. Reinstall the bias springs. These get torqued down to 30 foot pounds. The last item is the speedometer gear assembly. I didn't take it apart. There's probably a sealant here that I don't know if it's available or not. It didn't look like it was leaking, but I cleaned it up. I greased the o ring that was on it and I just simply install it in its position. And I rotate it until the slot appears for the hole down. And we'll catch the bolt for the hole down. So we're pretty much done here. I just wanted to show you a few things. With the HVDA conversion, what they've done is basically move the shifter forward. And you see it lines up now with, these, with the new cover they supply. And you had to cut the gasket out to clear this piece over here. So this will go like that, it fits in there. You have these little spacer washers that'll go on like this and I'll put them all together like this for now. And put the housing on and then the guy will pick it up and he might have to take this off again to play with the shifter what they want to do. But that's pretty much it. So this is going to go on again like this with the washers and the whole conversion is together. 
So the transmission's all done. It's all back together and rebuilt. I think it came out pretty good. Uh, looks a hell of a lot better than it, when it first originally came into the shop. If you took the time to look at the first part video, you'll see what I'm talking about. It came in pretty messy looking. Anyway, it looks really great. A few things I want to point out. I'm using a quartermaster hydraulic release bearing setup on the front of this. This is because it's for a conversion to a Triumph. Normally, this is just built onto the bell housing. They actually have an adapter bell housing for this that goes in place. And so it will fit on the Triumph engine. The other thing is, is the shifter box on this is from HVDA, moves the shifter forward and the customer has to use the Triumph shifter and the shifter cap from the Triumph transmission, which I do not have. And the other is the dust shield is taken off the tail. Because they use this big yoke that's going to slide in here like this, okay, that may foul against the dust shield. And so I'm not too sure of the clearances of the Triumph, what, what the floor looks like. Uh, it may be possible they can clean the shield up, cut it down a bit and trim it down and fit it back on here if they feel they need to do that. But that kind of stuff needs to be done while the transmission's in the car to fit things up. I don't like taking a guess and cutting things up. So it's better that they take it, fit it into the car. Maybe when the guy gets it done, I'll take some short videos and put it up on YouTube so you can finally see how this thing looks in the, in the car. But that's it. Came out really good again. I'm really happy with it. And I hope this video taught you something and you, you get something out of it. Anyway, if you can, it would mean a lot to me if you take the time to subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow me on Instagram and Facebook. All that information is coming right up on the video. And again, thank you for watching. Appreciate it.